Genesis 27, verses 1 to 4. Isaac is about to read his last will and testament. I wonder if you've ever witnessed the uh, reading of a will. It's rather strange and solemn. And it makes you think about the person who's about to die or contemplating dying. And he's calmly arranging the ordering of his property and uh, goods, you know, my penny whistle goes to, my used sock collection goes to, you know, he's organising what's going to happen after he's gone, arranging for the funeral hymn. So Isaac knew it was it was coming, and he had a few reminders to that fact. He's, he said, it, the, the text says, his eyes were dimming, his eyesight was failing. And of course, some people just sort of drop out of view, don't they? A, a car crash, a heart attack, uh, a grand piano landing on their head, and all of a sudden they're gone. But many people, maybe most people, don't go simply out of this world and into the next world. They have a few reminders that this time is coming. God allows reminders into your life. Your hair starts falling out, or your teeth start falling out. Uh, your memory starts to fade, and and, and I've forgotten all the other reminders. Anyway, Isaac wanted to get ready. He wanted to get ready for something he knew was coming. And first off, he wanted Esau, his, his, uh, his favourite son, to do something that Esau had done presumably many times before, to take his bow and arrow to go outside and to bring some game and to bring a feast and to make a meal for his father. But really, it's like Isaac wanted to feast in his son's affection one, one more time. He was going around a familiar circuit one more time. As if you were uh, about to move house and so you go around your property one more time and have a look and have a think. It's kind of poignant, isn't it? And uh, um, I, I remember, uh, it's like thinking of somebody's last words. And I remember uh, John Lemesier's last words were, I'm feeling much better now. Something poignant about going through things one more time. Do you remember when Jesus even said, uh, with desire, I have desired to eat the Passover with you one more time? We've done this lots of times before, but I, I desire to eat the Passover with you one more time, with my friends, with my loved ones. It's very poignant. And so, in a sense, uh, Isaac had received the last rites, you might say, and now he was getting ready. It sounds a bit morbid, but I guess we've got to say, are, are you ready? Are, are, you, are you sorted? Are you ready? For that last time. And then at this sensitive moment, when he's getting ready to depart, his son Jacob and his wife Rebecca are getting ready to deceive. They're getting ready to con the old guy. And Jacob and Rebecca both deceive Isaac. They both sin, but in, in slightly different ways. Each of them were trying to overreach Esau for different reasons. But the sin was not quite identical, I don't think. I mean, Rebecca was ambitious, but it was for the sake of her son. She wasn't grasping something for herself. She was grasping it for Jacob. And whatever the consequences. So if Isaac had his favourite, Esau, and all that lovely ready supply of venison, um... Rebecca had her favourite, and that was Jacob, and she, they were both rooting for their own favourites. Okay, and she said, upon me be the curse, my son. So it doesn't clear away the guilt, but it uh, changes things slightly, that she was in fact a mother. Do you think? Do you think? A mother's love, does that cover it? Is that, is that okay? Now the problem is not that Rebecca loved Jacob too much. I don't think you can love someone too much. What do you think? I don't think you can. It's not the intensity of the affection, but it's the interference of that, infect, uh, of that affection with truth. And she loved her son more than she loved the truth. She loved her son more than she loved God. And that was a, a big problem. That, in fact, was idolatry. Jesus said... Uh, if any man love father or mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. That's pretty tough. But he's saying even human love cannot be allowed to be an idol 
that replaces God. And when I first started uh, courting Val, I asked the Lord what would please her. And he said to me, 25 years ago, he said to me, please me. And if you please me, that will please Val. It's good, isn't it? He has to come first. He has to come first. And if he does come first, that priority, that firstness, gives a shine and a glow to all the human love that comes second. I believe it. And it gives a glow and a radiance that mere human affection, mere human affection, cannot give. You remember, Abraham loved his son, Isaac, but he was ready to sacrifice his son because he loved God more. And God knew what he was doing. Okay. I mean, what happens later when Rebecca and Jacob have got what they want, you know, the inheritance, the, the legacy of Isaac, by false means? Will it not poison all that they've gained? Of course it will. Love has to include respect. There's always reasons to sin. <laughs> no one lies for its own I think I'll lie. No one lies for its own sake. They always have a reason to lie. They're always manoeuvring and pushing forward. For something else but her love for Jacob allows her to have no thought of her eldest son or of her her, her husband on his, on his deathbed so there's a kind of uh, obsessive compulsive <laughs> element to here a sort of inflexible thing that she's looking inflexibly in the pursuit of her loved son and so what is true has become false and what is tender-hearted has become hard and cruel because it's going to one end. Now we do this sort of thing all the time. You know, you think of like um, parents who have a child that they love, who happens to be very talented, and you have this awful thing called child celebrity or infant celebrity, and they're sacrificing the natural process of their child's development for the sake of distinction and fame. Okay. But think of Jacob's sin. Jacob had ambition too, but he not the, the push to carry the scheme out. It was Rebecca's idea. And his problem was being weak and pliable, and he became a tool of her scheming. And that tiny embryonic guilt inside him, doing something that he knew to be wrong. He was more afraid of, of uh, doing it, not, not doing it correctly, than he was of the fact that the thing itself was not good, was not moral, was not correct. And he drifted into becoming what his name, you know, the name Jacob means trickster, means supplanter. And he became his name. Now we make choices. We make choices like we're drifting on a motorway junction and we slide off and all of a sudden we have gone the wrong way. And that is the point. It coloured and transformed the whole of Jacob's life. This one wrong choice. So let's leave it there. Let's leave it there with this thought that God allows you free will to choose, but choose well, because the choices that you make take you way off track from the destiny that he has planned for you. It was a long time before Jacob became Israel. Okay, amen. God bless.